Good evening, it's 7 p.m. and I'd like to open the November 19th school committee meeting. This meeting is being held virtually through Zoom. The town of Littleton began conducting remote participation Zoom meetings pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law on March 19th, 2020. Since that time, unanticipated legal concerns relating to the open meeting law have been brought to our attention by the town clerk. Those concerns were supported by the attorney general's office and confirmed by town council. One concern is that the chat function allows a parallel text conversation to a board's public meeting. Chat is essentially running commentary that is occurring, but is not moderated or followed by the chair. All participants and listeners may not be aware of comments being made because some meeting participants join by phone and do not see these conversations. Another concern is conversations between residents within the chat room, which are not incorporated into the public record. In response to these concerns, the town will implement the following changes, which in no way prohibit any member of the public from participating in discussion and sharing information during a public meeting, and will ensure that all listeners and participants have equal access to this meeting. People that join the meeting are set so that their microphones are muted. If you called in by phone, please use star six to mute or unmute your phone. So that the meeting can occur in an orderly fashion, we ask the people who join keep their microphones on mute so background noises do not interfere with the meeting. If you wish to participate in the meeting, please use the raise your hand function available on Zoom, or if you called in by phone, dial star nine, which will activate the raise your hand function. The meeting host will notify the chair of the raised hands and the chair will determine whether and when to allow public comment. When called upon, participants should unmute then state their name and address. After speaking, we request that the participant return the microphone back to mute. All right, bring that out of the way. We will go to the consent agenda, the minutes from November 12th, 2020 and oath to bills and payroll. Make a motion to approve the minutes from November 12th and the oath to bills and payroll. I'll second that motion. A motion made and second. Is there any comments on the consent agenda of the Office of Bills and Payroll? Hearing none, I'll go for a roll call vote. Brad? Brad Austin, yes. Justin? Justin McCarthy, yes. Matt? Matt Hunt, yes. And Mike Fontanella votes yes as well. All right. Get that out of the way. There are two sections in the meeting, at least, for input from interested citizens, one now and one closer to the end of the meeting. If there are any interested citizens who'd like to speak before the school committee, please use the raise your hand function. And our meeting moderator, Dorothy Malone, will elevate you to be able to participate in the meeting. We do not have any hands right now. Okay. Seeing none, we'll move along. Do we have anything we need to go over, Dr. Clenchy, in recognition? No, I don't have anything tonight. Okay. We do have a few uh, presentations, but I would like to start. It's not on the agenda, but it's one we've been doing on a regular basis. We have Katrina Wilcox Hagberg with us. Well, we did. She's, she's turned her camera. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Who's uh, quickly getting used to deadline pressure and has downloaded the latest uh, statistics on uh, the community by community uh, COVID statistics. So, Katrina, why don't you show us what you have for us tonight? All right. So let's see. Where are we? Do you see my slides? Mm -hmm. Every time it moves everything around on me. Hold on. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I don't like the pressure. It's very quick. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, Kevin Davis has helped me automatically download a lot of the data. And unfortunately, there's not that many towns that are less than five cases. So my workload is reduced because of that. Um, unfortunately, I would rather it be higher in that sense. So this is the um, daily dashboard. This is today's um, information that the state provides. There is over 2,500 cases today, 917 hospitalizations and 27 deaths. Um, this is the age groups that number of cases by age group for the period of um, November 1st to November 14th. So these are the two weeks post, thank, post Thanksgiving, post Halloween, um, that we were think wondering what was happening with holidays and the age group that rose substantially is the 20 to 29 year olds um, during that time frame. Everyone else also increased, which is not as substantially. So you guys have seen this graph before. Um, and unfortunately this week we pretty much hit the same um, level that we were at at our peak last spring. 
Um, and remember in March, we had our schools shut down, businesses were shut down, people were really not moving anywhere. Um, and that is why we could bend the curve down as we were trying to get a handle on things, especially when testing wasn't available. Um, so, and despite all of our mitigation efforts in place, we were actually much more mobile and socializing and mixing more than we had we were in the spring and the summer. And as a result, since you know, beginning of September, we've had a substantial increase in our rates. Um, so this week, the average daily incidence rate for the last 14 days was 29. Last week, that was about 20. The week before that, it was 15. So we are quickly escalating upwards, it's close to exponential. This probably is exponential, actually. Um, so this is the number of cases each day just for the last six weeks. And you can see at the beginning of the last six week period, which was beginning mid October, we were like, you know, 600 to 800 cases a day. It's like 700, 800. And now we are much closer to 3000 cases a day being diagnosed. Um, so we are, everything is pointing up. Unfortunately, Governor Baker said last week, there's been a sevenfold increase in the number of cases since Labor Day. So we've had substantial rise in our cases. And that's despite our testing levels being pretty static. Um, they have a little bit of growth since the middle of October, but um, the last few weeks they've been pretty set and not a lot. Um, I have to say our state's testing a lot, which is great because that means we're catching things. Um, we're not under testing. We might be, who knows, but um, the fact that we are steadily doing a hundred thousand cases, a <laughs> hundred thousand tests a day um, means hopefully we will be catching more things and the average turnaround to get results is two days. So unfortunately we see the rise in the test positivity. So this is the number of PCR tests that are percent positive. And the blue line includes the higher education colleges, um, the routine testing they're doing just to make sure there's no outbreaks on campus. So this is all the testing in the state. And we've, as I keep showing, keeps going up. We're now around 3%, 3.2%. And when you take out the college testing, which they are just doing a lot more tests per capita than the rest of the state, um, when you remove them, we're about 5%, 5.24% in testing this week. Not great, that's not the trend we wanna see. So um, I'm just gonna breeze over some of these, but hospitalizations are increasing substantially. And um, there's been a twofold increase that was of last week, but there's actually been a bigger jump this week. So that's gonna be higher um, since Labor Day. And a field hospital is being opened up in Worcester in early December because those hospitals are reaching capacity. And then deaths are the last lagging metric and we are starting to see an increase in those. So um, last few weeks, we've had about 20 case, sorry, 20 deaths, confirmed COVID deaths per day. Yesterday it was 47 and today it's closer to 30. It's 27, I think is what I said earlier. So we are suddenly jumped, which is not a good sign. We also crossed a very sad milestone last week, which was over 10,000 deaths here in Massachusetts. So this is the um, rate per 100,000 by age group. And this is important because it helps us kind of see who's who, who to target for, um, interventions for information to. So as you can see, the rates continue to climb for all age groups. Um, no one can be sheltered where everyone's exposed. Um, the rates are highest among this 20 to 29 year old group right after Halloween, it just shot up their curve really turned worse. Um, but also we've got steady increases in 30 to 39, 40 to 49 and 50 to 59. And um, so this age bracket, this 20 to 59 age bracket, it's a working population. It's like the age group that you would expect to be working um, households, are still um, the driving clusters, like 90% of all clusters are among households. And Jim Gareffi from the Board of Health reported a couple of weeks ago that the adult is usually the first person in a family cluster to be to test positive. So it might be good if everyone looks around their workplaces if you're working in person and see where you can make sure you're masking, distancing, wash your hands more often, anything you can do to help um, prevent spread while you're at work. Um, this 20 to 29 group is concerning. 
And particularly because this is young college students and young adults who we would expect to see come home for the holidays. So I will get to that in a little bit, but this recent uptick is not good. So the state changed how they're classifying and um, doing the color calculations for risk assessment the, on November 5th. So Littleton, I'm still pretty sure falls in the under 10,000 pop population level and no one's told me differently. So I'm gonna continue assuming that. Um, so this is when we track, so that means that we are, our thresholds are based off number of cases for the two week period um, that are reported. So you can see that I've colored the old thresholds the old way. So you can kind of see how they relate, relate to the new color thresholds um, on the right side of this dark line. Um, you can see our trend has just increased up for cases over time. And our highest number of cases per date were 19, which was two weeks ago. And we have since dropped and then come back a little bit, but we haven't reached that peak again. Um, so two things, we're now technically in yellow. We were in green last week. I wouldn't focus much on the color coding because I think it can fool you, especially when you're thinking about the old thresholds. So we are we still have more cases than we did before they changed the color thresholds. However, I really like this little dip down and I'll get to that in a second. So I don't think it's all bad. Um, I still think we should be looking at the rates compared to the um, communities around us. I didn't show you the method slide. We've been going through those, but those are the community groupings where we looked at the border, slightly bigger in the surrounding communities, the 495 belt, um, Middlesex County and the state. And as you can see, the state, the county, the 495 belt and our border communities all doubled in their rates this week compared to two weeks ago. Um, our surrounding communities tripled. This is driven by um, a couple clusters, one being in the um, correctional facility in Shirley. And Littleton's actually lower. So while we were still, we were yellow and we had 16 cases, our, we're still lower than that peak we, where we were two weeks ago. So that's why we look different. However, I'll take lower. Especially when I, um, when you look at it, graph to everyone else. So when they say bend the curve, like change your behavior so you can bend the curve, as you can see, everyone else is try, like just rocketing upward and we kind of bent our curve. So what's going to happen in the next few weeks really um, matters for us. So don't like, this is a good sign for Littleton. We've, we've dipped down, we're holding steady. We haven't gone back up that trajectory we were on at the end of or through October was a little, it was very concerning, but we dipped back down. So if we can keep this up, we are doing good. So don't relax now because um, the upcoming few weeks is our real test with Thanksgiving. And then if you um, track it against our surrounding communities, as you can tell, Shirley is that cluster at um, the correctional facility is really impacting Shirley. There's Lunenburg, there's um, Lancaster, there's a few other towns that have some sharp rises. But if you look, the black line is the aggregated rate when we average across all of these towns for the surrounding communities. And we've been above the line consistently. And now we're below the line. We're one of the lower towns. So this um, it slightens my heart a little bit because we've been talking about doing the right thing and wearing the mask and distancing. And I love to see that our data shows that we've, we've changed things. We've talked about this for over a month now. Um, and it takes a few weeks to see these kind of dips and changes in data. And so this, this makes me feel good. It makes me feel hopeful for that people are really um, take it, doing the right things now and that we can actually keep our schools open and our businesses open. So, and the nice thing is our test positivity is following the same trend. So we are, have about 2% test positive positivity here in Littleton, but that's still lower than it was two weeks ago. Um, and everywhere else is higher. So we ranging from um, two to four and a half and that on um, all of those other areas. But we're hoping that Littleton can hold in this pattern right about where we are if we can. Especially given that the state is really skyrocketing, the fact that we kind of took another a bend down is awesome. And then when you look at test positivity, um, the nice thing is that we have the same bend in the curve here that we did in, in cases. And this is, 
another encouraging sign that something's changed, that maybe we're doing the right things, um, that we can hopefully keep our rates right where they are. So I want to say keep it up. And then I wanted to get into a couple of things that um, are coming out. So we've heard the last two weeks that there are some vaccines coming and they're going, um, there's some really promising results there, but the average Littleton person is probably not going to get access to them until mid to late 2021. So until then, while we wait until we get our vaccines, we really have to use every tool in our tool belt to help prevent the spread. And masks are one of those least expensive and easiest to use things. Um, and the evidence is really mounted that they're very um, useful in helping to control the amount of virus in the community, uh, the air around us. Um, the CDC actually came out and strengthened their scientific brief. And the um, if you read it, the reference list is actually much longer than the <laughs> brief itself, which is amazing. Um, so masks help reduce the amount of virus that circulate in the air, but they also help filter um, the virus that comes back to you and that you inhale. And if you inhale less virus or inoculum, then you'll have less severe disease. So that's, um, I, so masks protect others and they protect you. And I just wanted to remind everyone about the mask order that is currently in effect. Everyone um, over age five and above must be wearing a face covering um, in public and that's indoors or outdoors. It's whether you can keep distance or not. It's if you're in public, you wear a mask. And the other thing that came out in the mask order is that um, they emphasize that face coverings are required when you're in a vehicle with a non-household member. And I, I do wanna bring this up because I've actually observed this around town. Um, I've observed high schoolers jumping in their cars, taking their masks off, and they know they're not in the same family unit. I've observed um, the same thing happening at pickup um, when I pick up my kids from school. So. I know that kids are kind of done wearing a mask and it doesn't seem like it's a long trip, but just have them keep their masks on for a few more minutes while you drop them off at their house. It's really important to um, mask up when you're around someone who's not in your household. So as I said earlier, I'm, I'm concerned about our young adults and college students when they come home. And um, so the concern is that college students returning home may introduce COVID-19 into households. And we know that households are the biggest um, number of clusters that are happening because you're just not wearing your mask or distancing around your own family. Um, so, and this is the age bracket that had the biggest, um, the steepest increase in the last few weeks. So there's a lot more circulating among that age group. So just wanted to keep everyone in mind that um, if your students coming home and they're not trying to limit their activities right now, it's a great time for them to stop going out and socializing. I know that's a hard thing to say when it's the weekend before you go home from school and you're not going to see your friends for a while, but really try to get them not to um, go out and party this weekend. Um, ask, the state came out with a new order. So Massachusetts colleges and universities are being required to test all their students before they head home. And if someone is positive, they're um, being told by the government to keep their students on campus in their isolation housing. Um, those that are coming from outside of Massachusetts still have to follow the travel order. So they have to complete the travel form and quarantine for 14 days or produce a negative COVID test within whatever the current time frame is. Um, and unless they're coming from a lower risk state and the lower risk states um, right now are Hawaii, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine, although the governor did say that they update those every Friday and they expect to take two states off that list. So anyone wanna bet which neighbors are not going to be lower risk states come Friday? We'll find out. Um, the other thing is, even if your, your um, student is, or your, your child's being tested before they come home from college, um, it's really important to remember that testing isn't, isn't testing has problems too. You can, it's a snapshot of the day you took the test. It's not hundred percent reliable and you can be exposed after, or you just may not have had enough virus in your system to have the test register as um, positive. So it's really important that um, you, if they test and they test negative and they come home, that's one of those layers of Swiss cheese, but they, you guys really I can't emphasize this enough, like wear masks, um, distance, if you can isolate your, your um, family members away from the student for at least a few days and test again, that all of those things help um, increase the safety or decrease the likelihood that you will transmit, like your family will transmit um, COVID among your, among your household. And 
Um, so just keep up all the good stuff that you can when you're adding them home and do the best you can there. So the next few weeks are a big test. Um, at, at the attestation form, you guys have taken it seriously. You're putting something out there asking people to reconsider. And um, we have evidence from Canada that Thanksgiving was a big um, event that fueled their growth in cases. Can I, can I just interrupt you real quickly? You do know Dr. Clenchy's from Canada, right? <gasps> I didn't. Okay. so I mean, I love Canada. I grew up no. miles from the border. I have Maybe nothing against Canada. <laughs> just edit what you th were thinking about saying just a little bit, okay? All right. I'm glad you warned me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so just to say that um, Canadian Thanksgiving is October 12th, and the cases were already on the rise when Thanksgiving happened. But um, Canada was reporting their highest cases to date in the two weeks after, which is the incubation period for um, COVID. And then, but that was also at a time that their testing was really decline in decline. They were, um, there was, there weren't enough tests. So they were limiting the test to people with symptoms. So they were not testing everyone who had an exposure or anyone who might've been asymptomatic. So when there are more cases and less testing, you know, there's explosive growth happening. Um, in addition, they had some robust contact tracing information come out and um, it indicated that Thanksgiving was directly related to the COVID spread up in Canada. And there were some other pieces of evidence too that really led to Thanksgiving and family gatherings really increased the rates and spread. And you guys saw this, it was in the attestation form. So I won't go through it again, but I do have to say the CDC came out today and um, strongly suggested nobody travel for Thanksgiving. And given that our rates around our state, even within our state are exploding everywhere, it's really important if you can celebrate at home with your household, that's the safest way to do it. Um, if you do choose to travel, these are still good, um, are good strategies to help reduce your risk. Um, the one thing I have to say is there's no longer, we're only a week away, so you can't quarantine for 14 days before um, Thanksgiving. So you could quarantine for seven, that is better than zero. Um, but again, it's really, it's safest to stay home. And if you do go, remember um, when it's, when it is not okay to go is when someone's diagnosed with, has symptoms of, or you're exposed to COVID or anyone else in your household meets those criteria, your family shouldn't be going to in-person gatherings and then the spread in our state is high. So even within our state, we're gonna be risking things if we're traveling to meet people outside of our households. And if you choose to test, remember it's a snapshot. It was one of your layers of protection. So it still needs to have mass distance, open your windows, doors, um, keep your visits short, You know, be outside if you can, all those things. And then um, I keep hearing, and this is, I've been hearing this for a few weeks and I've been trying to figure out how to explain it well, but those COVID bubbles that we all kind of formed naturally in spring and summer, um, now that school's open, works are open, everyone's moving around more um, and, and COVID is circulating at a higher rate, we really don't have a bubble. So if you're engaging in any way in the outside world in person, you, you have exposures and, um, the other thing that came out this week is those cluster information that the DPH has been presenting. Um, I saw a lot more work related, occupational related um, clusters on that list this week. So if you're at work and you maybe have relaxed around your coworkers and you're, you've kind of, maybe it's time to like make sure you're masking distancing and, and open your window if you can and all the good things that we've keep talking about. Um, and in reality, we are actually all in the same bubble. So um, if we need to practice prevention daily in order to protect ourselves and our others and keep our schools open. And then we're going to leave on my Swiss cheese just because I like cheese. <laughs> so um, all of these layers help reduce the risk. They don't eliminate the risk. So every time you go out and anytime you gather with anyone outside your household, it's really important to keep layering up those strategies as many as you can put in place as possible to help reduce the spread of COVID in our area. And we're doing it. Our data is kind of stopped. We've put the, the cap on it. So let's keep it here by doing the right stuff. And that's it. All right. Thank you, Katrina, as always. Any questions or comments from the school committee? Yep, Brad, go ahead. 
Yeah, I'll just say thank you again, Katrina. It's, um, you know, I look at the reports when they come out at, you know, at 530 or so on Thursdays, but um, your ability to synthesize and explain it all so quickly is is really, really appreciated. Um, and it's it's nice. It's nice to hear someone who's looking at it as closely as you have some optimism that our, our measures are are, are mitigating um, some of the some of the risk. And so um, so thank you for that, too. I'm, I'm fully realize the next few weeks could come back and kick me. Like I recognize <laughs> I say it now and I am optimistic that people have changed their behaviors over the last few weeks, but. But it's just a snapshot really. It's, it's a okay. snapshot and we can, it can, COVID will kick us in the butt if we let it. So don't relax the next few weeks. All right, anybody else? All right, thank you, Katrina. We have a good Thursday next Thursday with your family, your media family. We won't talk to you. Uh, we'll see you in two Thursdays. All right, All right, thank you. Good night. All right, next on the agenda, we have a presentation on the Cross District Professional Development Day from Beth Steele. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for letting me present on our Cross District Professional Development Day. It's a day that I really love um, and, and I think a lot of our staff really love as well. And it's, it's a really nice um, day and happy to present about really good news. Um, so we do have a slideshow. I don't know if um, Dorothy, Judy, oh, Dave, thank you. Awesome. Um, so um, the day took place on Tuesday, November 3rd this year. And so while I have the honor of sharing about it tonight, um, I do really want to start off by emphasizing that I am one part of the planning team from Littleton. Um, the other two members of the planning team from Littleton are Natalie Croto and Julie Lord. Um, and so they are part of the team that I'm, I'm happy to be working with them to produce this day for Littleton. Um, so on our next slide, we'll see that this um, combination of cross district involves three districts, Air Shirley, Harvard, and us in Littleton. This is the fourth year that we've done this larger collaboration with the three districts in total and hosting this day rotates. Um, and so you may remember that we in Littleton hosted last year in person at the high school um, and so this year, um, Air Shirley, were, they were our hosts this year. And so this year was unique, um, as we can all imagine, and it was a fully virtual event. So the flyer on the right that you see on the screen right now was made by Paul Orzak. Um, Orzak, excuse me. He is our high school's library media specialist. And I really need to give a big shout out to Paul because I emailed him one day and just said, hey, Paul, here's this idea that we're going with, here's the title um, or the theme of the day, and here's the title, can you make something? Um, and pretty quickly, he turned around something that was really beautiful um, and captured the essence of the day. So really big thank you um, to Paul who created the flyer that allowed us to then share it out and advertise for the day. So the day, as you can see on the flyer, was um, titled Empowering All Learners Through Innovation. And as I said, it was a virtual um, event. So rather than seeing pictures of different sessions that were happening um, in this presentation, you're actually gonna see a lot of screenshots, um, mostly from Twitter. So um, in addition to having all of the presentations and whatnot on a video conferencing platform, we encouraged participants to also use Twitter as a second platform to share ideas, to collaborate um, and discuss. And so we use the hashtag Lash Learns. And so you can go on Twitter and type in Lash Learns and be able to see different um, posts that some of our staffs from all three districts put up that day. On the next slide, you see that our morning session <clears throat> um, was with George Koros. And so this year, our, our day was really broken down into two um, parts. And so in the morning, we had our keynote, um, and our keynote was with George um, Koros, who is a worldwide leader in the area of innovation. He's worked at all levels of education from K to 12 as a teacher, a technology facilitator, um, a school and district administrator. And additionally, he's an author. Um, and in particular, I'll point out two books, The Innovator's Mindset and Innovate Inside the Box, which those were the two that really kind of helped structure the theme for our day this year. 
And so what's actually an added bonus to having George be the keynote of our day for PD this year was that this summer we were able to host two book studies. Um, one was hosted in Littleton by two educators, Jen Fudo and Tracy Turner. Um, the other book study was hosted by an educator in Air, um, from Air Shirley. And so it was nice to be able to have some of our staff, 47 of our staff actually participated in one or both of the book studies. And so those that participated in the book study read the book by George Koros, um, and then were able to hear him speak in November on November 3rd, which was really nice. It was nice to see the connection of ideas um, and just to be able to hear someone um, that you've read their text is a nice um, addition that was we were able to make happen this year. So during the keynote, George Coro spoke about making connections um, with the heart and then the mind, how all of us are learners, not just our students, um, and how learning can be messy. And you can see that in the bottom right um, screenshot, right? That the success that we, a lot of people, we think it just is this straight arrow going up. Um, but in all reality, success and, and learning has a lot of twists and turns and backwards um, movements in addition to making its way forward. Um, and so he was able to really express this message in a real authentic way through storytelling, um, which is partially why it was a really well-received keynote from the morning session. On the next slide, you'll see that our afternoon sessions, um, it was broken into two smaller parts, but the afternoon was really um, a time um, for collaboration and reflection. And so providing this time for grade level staff and department members um, from all of the districts to connect, to talk, to share, to collaborate is something that we as a planning team really strongly value. And so this year, it was particularly important um, to be able to provide this time to everyone um, to connect with job alike staff and just share what is happening um, this year in particular. And so you can see from the screenshots that there was a lot of discussion and collaboration in the afternoon. And an interesting um, little tidbit, I was at the middle school today and I happened to notice that um, our PE and health teachers, Mr. Gillette and Ms. Bonacore were outside. And from a distance, I could see the kids, you know, they had noodles and it looked like a really fun game. And so I, I immediately went over. I was like, what, what game are we playing? This looks really fun. Um, and they actually they told me and they said, we got it from the November 3rd cross district PD day. And so it was, it, it's moments like that. I'm like, Oh yes. Like that day is so great. It's a really valuable um, time for our teachers to be able to share ideas with others. Um, so that was nice. It was a nice interaction today um, to see that on our next slide, <clears throat> you will see um, that while we certainly look at this day as a full PD day, professional development day, we also like to acknowledge that, there's more to the day than just listening to the keynote and the presentations. We like to add some fun when and where we can um, because learning should be fun. Um, and so this year we were able to offer digital bingo and you can see um, a little bit on the slide, the slide here, two bingo sheets. So bingo spot, the activities in those spots included things like share a resource on the day's padlet or create something from your learning today or follow a colleague on Twitter. Um, but in addition to those, we also put in um, spots that included some brain breaks, just being conscientious of not wanting staff to be sitting at the screen all day. And so some of the spots were also go for a walk um, wherever you are or go do a quick chore um, just to get people up and moving away from the screen. So in all, we actually had 23 LPS educators complete the bingo board, which earned them the 2020 Lash Learns badge, which you can see up in the upper left-hand corner of the screen here. <clears throat> On the next slide, um, like any good educator, we um, also like to gather feedback and get input from the participants of the day to find out what was good, um, what did we not like as much, where areas that we can improve and strengthen on this day. And so this year, um, the Cross District PD Day was really well received by many of our staff members. You can see on the top left chart here that over 93% over of all participants rated the day as good or better than good. Um, and that, that chart there is representative of all, all of the participants from all three districts. Um, you can also see underneath 
that chart some quotes. Um, and this is direct feedback from, from participants of the day. And so um, this was the best, most real inspiring PD I've ever been a part of, just what I needed at the time when I needed it the most, provided the spark I needed to innovate in my classroom. PD was a, a breath of fresh air. Um, it, was, it was nice to see that it's, it's the November PD day kind of comes at really a great time when everyone, it's a moment to pause and reflect and look at what we're doing. And this year it was particularly uh, appreciated for, for that purpose. So lastly, um, I would just like to say on the next slide, thank you um, to, to those that participated in the day, our staff that were active participants online and, and just being present for the day. Um, I'd like to really give a huge shout out and thanks to Julie Lord and Natalie Croto who were um, on the planning team and making the day happen for everyone. To Paul Orzik, who created the flyer for us, um, appreciated his work there. And then lastly, thank you to the school committee and for families for allowing us to continue a day like this that is really beneficial um, for, for all of us as learners. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Beth. Uh, I know it's a, it's a, is this the third year we've done this? This is the fourth. Fourth year. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a big lift um, for, for all of you to get all three districts coordinated like that, but um, it's a fascinating idea and it, to, to really spark people to not look at the same faces and hear the same voices all the time. I think that's great. Um, but it is a significant lift to pull that off. And you guys have, have shown you're, you're getting better and better every year. It's definitely a worthwhile effort from a school committee perspective. And I appreciate you putting the presentation together. That helps the community understand why we do those days and, and, and where the time is spent and how it's spent. So anybody else have any, any questions or input on the uh, develop, professional development day? Brad. Yeah, well, thanks so much for that presentation, Beth, and thanks to, to Julie and Natalie and the rest of your team. Um, one of the things I really like about that is the ability to get people, I think you're calling same jobs, but get historians with historians, math teachers with math teachers, language teachers. That's just, that's really important, and I'm glad y'all are doing that. And frankly, as someone who's done a lot of professional development, um, it gets a really bad rap. Um, it's, it's often um, not not always appreciated has, has been my experience. And um, to have 75% or higher say that it was very good or excellent, it's just a really amazing feedback. So well done. Thank you. All right. All right, we're good. Thank you uh, for that. All right, our next presentation is on capital funding for the FY22 budget. Steve, Mark, are you gonna take us through that? Hit the right button. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. I hope everybody stays safe. And I just want to say and remind everybody, uh, we're doing everything we can in the facilities to keep the facilities safe and clean. And there's plenty of PPE available and wipes and uh, cleaning supplies. So if there's any um, if there's any needs, please let us know. We'll get those to you uh, in the schools. Um, in the report is the... Um, FY22 capital request list. I'm sorry, it's uh, there's a lot of data in here. Um, a couple of minor changes. If you get down to um, item nine, um, keep scrolling down. Okay, stop right, stop right there. Uh, the description, the high school front office, and that got cut off. I apologize. That should say high school front office and guidance suite carpets. So that fourteen thousand five hundred is actually to replace the carpets in the front office, in the guidance suite, those are original carpets. They've been in the building now for 20 years and they're starting to show some wear and tear and uh, we really need to think about replacing those. Uh, the second correction is if you go to the left in the sheet, to the, um, I'm sorry, go to the right, go to the other, go the other way. <laughs> uh, yep, if you, you can stop right there. The top of the screen is that high school rooftop unit, that's 75,000. Uh, if you notice, I had dollar marks and question marks next to it because I wasn't sure of the price. Uh, we will update that before we submit that to the town and PMBC. Uh, that price tag is probably closer to about $200,000 to replace that rooftop unit. Uh, that's a big rooftop unit. Uh, we have to get cranes in to do it. Um, and that's a big unit. So um, I, that number was a placeholder and I just got that number today, uh, the estimate today. So uh, we will update that. So that 75,000 should be 200,000. Um, other than that, um, a lot of this uh, list is a carry forward from uh, the project, some of the projects that we had 
uh, requested as well last year um, that did not get funded through the town. Um, so it's up to school committee. If you want, I can go through one by one. Uh, if you want to scroll back to the left, um, uh, this these project range anywhere from uh, replacing uh, agent camera systems, replacing agent card access systems uh, at both uh, uh, at the at the middle school. Uh, it, um, some of these projects also, if you scroll up, uh, we have to replace a couple of the phone systems uh, at the Russell Street School and the central office. Uh, the town is looking at, um, so right now, Russell Street School and Central Office phones are tied into the town office building. Uh, the town office building is looking at replacing their phone system. Um, and um, we need to, and it probably makes sense to get off of that system. They're switching to a cloud-based system. We don't use a cloud-based system at the schools um, for a bunch of reasons, and I'm don't have all of those reasons at this point in time with me, but um, we do standalone systems. Um, and so the, the town is thinking about changing the way they do phone systems on their side and they're moving away from a single base system. Um, so we need to update those systems as well. Uh, the maintenance van uh, that's been on here for a couple of years. The current van we have is a 2006 uh, Chevy, E250 van. Uh, we bought it in 2010, so we've had it for 10 years. It has over 100,000 miles on it. It's starting to rust out and and uh, have issues. In fact, it has to go in the shop because Bill, the driver, is smelling gasoline as he's driving, so we need to get that in the shop. Um, but uh, it is time to look at replacing that van. Uh, if you want to scroll down, again, school committee interrupts. If you have questions, I don't know if you want me to go through line by line. Um, some of these, um, the uh, high school gym through Mike Lynn, uh, he's looking to replace the cardio equipment uh, at the gym. Um, I don't know how old that is. I don't know if anybody knows how old that is. It's pretty old, it needs to be replaced. Uh, we need to replace the flooring uh, in both the auxiliary gym and the weight room. And that project is actually on the PMBC side to the right side of that page. Um, um, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to scroll. I don't want to be scrolling all over the place, but um, it'll make people sick. But um, can I ask a question? Um, sure. It's Brad. Um, going back to the the high school where you are right now, the the rooftop HVAC system. You said it's yep. two hundred thousand to replace it. Um, am I correct in assuming that it's functioning now? It's just, but we just will need to replace it. Is that yes? It's 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 functioning now. It's starting to get to the point where. We're, we're replacing things on a constant basis. We've gone through two or three different compressors, um, a couple of other, other systems, the control systems. Um, they're all 20 years old. That unit was installed original to the building, so it's over 20 years old. Um, and while we maintain it and keep it running, it is time to start thinking about replacing these before they fail completely. So that's, yeah, that's so where that's that's But it is running now. It's performing the capacity. It's performing the specs now. It's just that we need to get ahead of it before it it stops doing that. That's correct. Gotcha. Okay, thank you, Steven. Instead of running down the rest of the list, so yeah, where are we in the in the process with presenting this to the town finance team and the finance committee uh, so that they can fit it into the capital request from the other departments, and yeah, but, and then uh, then we'll know where we think you know, what kind of budget we have, and, and then we can start. I know they're listed in priority, but we'll be able to make more, a more uh, legitimate determination about what we think is feasible in terms of the list that we have in front of us. Yeah, normally what we do is we submit the list to the town, and then they come back and tell us how much funding they're uh, able to provide, and we reserve the right to uh, move projects around within that funding um, as we see fit based on, on need at the time. Um, the, the PMBC side of that list, that's a list we submit to the PMBC. They have to discuss it and vote to uh, through their committee to make that request to the town. Usually, uh, PMBC has been uh, very cooperative in uh, accepting the projects that we've recommended to them. Um, so as soon as, as soon as we're done tonight, if there are no objections, 
Um, I'll, I'll clean up the sheet a little bit uh, and make those changes and then submit it to the town and the PNBC probably tomorrow or next week. The PNBC has seen a preliminary copy of this, um, but I do need to adjust it for that, that one change. So I'll, I'll release that to them uh, either tomorrow or next week. Okay. Can I, Steve, can I ask a follow-up question there? So just sure. to make sure I understand it. So on the school-based side, we're asking, or we have listed, I think, um, 13 projects and 313,000. Um, you're saying the town may say, hey, look, we can give you 240,000 of this. And that's when we revisit it and maybe move some things around or do we just- Correct. Okay. All right, thank Correct. you. That, that's, that's what's happened in the past. Right. So the determination for us tonight is just making sure that we're comfortable that this is the list we want to put forward, that there isn't anything on this list. The priority aspect of it, I don't think is a huge concern at the moment. It helps to have it, no no doubt about that. Um, but that'll become more compelling once we have a better idea of what our actual capital budget is looking like. Um, but if there's anything on the list that we don't truly think we need, then it you know, might behoove us to, to just push it you know, to next year. Um, or if there's something on the list that maybe we've talked about or something we've talked about in the past is not on the list, now's the time to, to you know, think about that and decide if we want to get it on the list. Right. And there is money on the PMBC side for a Shake a Lane long-term facility project. We talked about that. We had a meeting with MSBA. How we think that might move forward. Um, the high school, uh, the high school roof over the administrative wing and the cafeteria. Um, I think I've explained this before. It's like playing whack-a-mole these days. So we fix one leak um, and two or three leaks show up in other parts of their roof. Um, again, that roof is 20 plus years old and we really need to fix it. I, I think John's down shaking his head. Um, I think he, he would agree that there are quite a, a few leaks in that roof we need to get a, um, we need to fix. And the best way to do that is um, a complete roof replacement because it's been patched so many times. We're putting patches on top of patches at this point in time. All right. I, and I then the answer other questions. Yeah, the, and then the other thing to keep in mind, I just want from a historical context, when, when I say it is a good effort for us to think about if there's anything that's that's not on the list that we might want to, but I will say we've never gotten all of our list funded in any given year, so keep that in mind. <laughs> so anything that's, anything that's priority 14 or less is probably not going to make the cut anyway. Frankly, you know, 11, 12, and 13 are probably going to be stretches to begin with, um, but we'll see. We'll see. So that's that's what we're trying to do tonight is just figure out, you know, what what we want to submit as a first step towards uh, getting an idea from the town where they think the capital budget overall with all the other departments that have all their other capital uh, requirements or, or, or desires is. All right. Any other glad thoughts? to answer any other questions. Right. Any other comments or anything? All right, I think we can go ahead and, and, and submit that list, Steve, and then uh, then we'll see what the town comes back with, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start taking a closer look at that. And, and I'll update that. school committee as soon as I have additional information. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, you everyone. All right, uh, at this point, we'd like to talk about um, under, I think it's, sorry, I just got to scroll up real quick. Yeah, under old business, we're going to talk about the surveys uh, that are coming up that we have out there to talk about, how to get feedback from uh, families and students and staff on the current uh, implementation of hybrid and remote learning. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. I'm fortunate to be able to uh, celebrate two Thanksgivings every year. <laughs> Looking forward to the second one. Uh, as uh, we've mentioned before, we've partnered with Panorama Education uh, this year to uh, develop surveys. Uh, Wednesday morning, we sent uh, an email out to families and staff indicating that they would be receiving an email from uh, Panorama uh, with a link to the survey. So if you uh, have not uh, found that email in your inbox, I'd recommend that you check your spam to uh, make sure that it didn't go in there. Uh, as Mike already mentioned, we were focusing on three areas. Uh, first area, academic access and progress uh, as it pertains to uh, hybrid and remote learning plans. Uh, overall, uh, student well-being. And uh, the third area is equity. The uh, deadline for submission of the surveys is December 4th. 
we're excited to get the results and, and uh, take a look at them. And uh, that will certainly help uh, uh, shape and, and uh, also have us reflect on what we're currently doing and, and seeing uh, what areas we're excelling in and, and what areas we perhaps need to rethink. Yeah, I know from my personal perspective, uh, thinking about these surveys and thinking about we've had discussion with in, in public input on the as we get to the semester ends and the marking term ends, there's going to be an opportunity for families to reevaluate uh, how they want their students to participate during this year. But it's also not going to be an opportunity for us as a school committee and an administration and a teaching staff to think about, you know, do we want to make any adjustments in what we're doing, what's working, what's not working, and getting that input from all the stakeholders is going to be crucial to allowing us to have a meaningful discussion and analysis and, and make good decisions about what we want to adjust if there is anything that we do want to adjust. I would assume that there is. I mean, what we've done has been Herculean. It's unbelievable what the teachers have been able to do and how quickly they've ramped up in terms of an unprecedented challenge to change the delivery model. Um, but knowing that we did it so quickly, there's obviously room for improvement. Ideas that, that we didn't know at the time or problems we didn't foresee will get addressed if we get the right feedback. Like we want every opportunity to, to, to make it even better uh, than it is right now so that we can continue to mitigate the negative impact that our, our students and staff are experiencing. So really want to push on people to take the time to get that in and get it done so that we have a good representation of points of view and information that's really going to help us all. So um, really encourage people to get after that. That would be great. Any and other questions or comments on that? And we're also surveying students uh, in grades three to 12. Right. Right. Yeah. So parents can ask their students to do it and the students can ask their parents to do it. The teachers can remind the students that would be great. And uh, if the administration can keep, you know, in their various social media and communication paths, keep putting out those gentle reminders. That would be great. All right, and next we wanna have an update on the uh, process for uh, the attestation form relative to returning from Thanksgiving. Uh, yes, uh, well, we certainly have received some uh, positive media attention since we've uh, sent our <laughs> attestation form out to families. Uh, the uh, due date for this form is uh, Monday, November 23rd. Uh, we've had uh, a great response rate. Uh, when I checked just before the meeting tonight, we had 466 responses uh, without having an exact uh, number of families that are in the, the hybrid model. I would say my rough estimate is we're uh, over 90% uh, in terms of our return rate. So we're shooting for 100%. So families, if you haven't had a chance to fill it out yet, we'd Greatly appreciate to uh, filling it out uh, prior to our deadline on Monday. All right. Any questions or comments on that? I, I have a shout out to uh, our PD committees in the uh, three districts that we've been uh, teaming with over the last four years. Uh, the opportunity to team with our districts also means that uh, we can afford to bring in high quality speakers and, and it truly does make a, a difference when you're, you're uh, aligning your PD with uh, the strategic plan and, and we always look for commonalities in the three districts as we're planning that day. Uh, this year we brought uh, somebody in who's uh, a world renowned speaker. Uh, he's a Western Canadian boy <laughs> and uh, in fact, he started his teaching career the first year I became a superintendent, and uh, he was uh, hired in a district about an hour away from where I was. Uh, after hearing him speak, I regret that I didn't have an opportunity to hire him, hire him as a teacher in, in one of the schools back then, but uh, he was terrific. He uh, was inspirational, motivational. And uh, truly, our, our, our teachers in all three districts uh, were, were just uh, completely uh, taken with the message that he had. And, and uh, we're hoping that that perpetuates uh, throughout our school year. So uh, it was also nice for me to, to hear that uh, Western Canadian accent again. I haven't heard it <laughs> for a while. And uh, it's just nice to see somebody from uh, my uh, old uh, stomping grounds, so to speak, where I grew up, uh, you know, uh, educated in, in, in the same province and, and uh, was an educator and then, uh, hit the speaking circuit and has been uh, very successful. So thanks again to everybody that helped uh, organize that day. 
All right, thank you. We are at the uh, second opportunity in our meeting for input from interested citizens. If there's anybody there that wants to uh, bring anything up with the school committee, please use the raise your hand function. Not seeing any hands, Chairman. All right, not seeing any tonight, that's fine. We'll go quickly through the subcommittee reports. PMBC, uh, uh, we don't have an update tonight. Timlin is not with us. Uh, budget subcommittee, any update? I know we talked about cap up. Is there anything else we need to? No, Steve's re report pretty much covered the uh, okay. current topics. All right, very good. Anything from policy tonight? Nothing from policy tonight. All right. Uh, then I will bring us to the end of the meeting. Uh, remind everybody that next Thursday we won't be meeting. It'll be the first Thursday in a while, but we'll take advantage of it. Uh, enjoy a, a safe and healthy holiday as best we can. Uh, if I have no other business, I will entertain a motion for adjournment. Make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. second. Yeah, motion made and seconded. I'll take a roll call vote. Brad? Brad Austin says yes. Matt? Matt Hunt says yes. Justin? Justin McCarthy, yes. And Mike Fontella votes yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, LCTV, Judy and Dave, and Bettina and Dorothy. Enjoy the holiday, everybody, and we'll see you in two weeks.